Classically Trained, episode 27. Welcome to another episode of the Classically Trained Podcast, the podcast for life and leadership lessons from video games. I'm your host, John D. Harrison, and you are in for a special treat. Today's interview is with Patrick Scott Patterson, a man who is a wealth of knowledge, information, and experience within the video game industry. So you definitely want to hang around and listen to all his great answers uh, and the conversation that we had. It was just a real pleasure getting to know him and spending a little time together. Before we jump into the interview, I would like to mention that today's episode is brought to you by the book, Mastering the Game, What Video Games Can Teach Us About Success in Life. Now it's available in paperback and Kindle exclusively on Amazon.com. So search for Mastering the Game, or even search for the author, that's John D. Harrison. Now let's jump right into today's interview with Patrick Scott Patterson. Patrick Scott Patterson, also known as Scott to his friends, is a multimedia personality who specializes in video gaming and pop culture. His work has appeared across a wide variety of different media, including live speaking engagements, television, film, radio, and more. Patterson fell in love with video gaming when he first encountered a Pac-Man arcade machine as a child in September 1981. He was so enamored with video games that he eventually found interest not only in the games themselves, but also the history of the industry and the culture surrounding it. So in time, he became the go-to guy for media discussions about gaming topics ranging from controversies over violent video games to a variety of historical topics and chats about the current industry events. Among the media outlets that have cited or featured Patterson are USA Today, the Los Angeles Times, G4 TV, Guinness World Records, ESPN, NBC News, the Chicago Sun-Times, and a variety of regional newscasts, newspapers, and radio stations across America. Patrick Scott Patterson has also appeared in a variety of video game films, such as World 1-1 and Nintendo Quest, and a wide range of live events. So please welcome to the Classically Trained Podcast, Patrick Scott Patterson. Hey, thanks for having me, man. I'm glad to be here. Absolutely my pleasure. I have a fantastic list of questions I can't wait to get into with you today. So if you don't mind, I'm going to jump right into them here. My first question for you is how did you first become interested in what eventually would become video game history? I can almost pinpoint two specific instances. I mean, one of the, I started gaming uh, in the fall of 1981, and I was a really young kid. Um, so when you're that age and something gets popular, you haven't been around long enough to realize there's going to be times where that's not necessarily the case. And uh, so when... Uh, we pulled up, me and my dad pulled up to our main arcade hangout uh, in early 1984 and saw that it was closed uh, due to, to non-payment of rent. I was like, hey, what's going on? And uh, he told me what he'd been hearing on TV about the video game industry in North America was experiencing a massive crash. And I didn't understand how that was possible, so I wanted to know why. And uh, a few years later... I can pinpoint the exact book. It was a, a book called uh, The Winner's Book of Video Games by C- Craig Cuby, I believe is how his last name was said. It was in my middle school library, and uh, I checked it out thinking, you know, hey, this is a, a bunch of tips on the games I played a few years ago and still play when I can find them now. But it had a lot in there about the people who had created the games. Uh, I had a lot of stuff in there about Dave Toyer and Nolan Bushnell, Ralph Baer, Donna Bailey, Ed Log, um, as well as talking to some of the players, uh, anywhere from a bunch of guys that hung around a donut shop and got good at Pac-Man, uh, to Eric Jenner, who was uh, probably the top competitive gamer in those early days. And uh, I found myself being more fascinated by their stories 
than the games, you know, the, the other game content in there. So I started gathering up all I could at libraries and half price books, used bookstores, things like that, uh, and just never stopped. Hmm. That's really remarkable because we, we don't always get those stories behind the games that we've enjoyed. I, I know personally I grew up in the, the 80s and 90s and had a chance to experience the games, but I missed out on a lot of the stories. What has been the response that you've seen in recent years to others who didn't know these stories, but you have a chance to share with them? Um, a lot of times, you know, I see people light up and, and, and for some reason, this is still kind of the norm. And I think maybe as part of the reason why video games are still considered to be a, uh, almost an island unto themselves as opposed to films and television and books and music, even though video gaming outgrosses all of that stuff. Mm. And it's because the there's not enough faces and names being put out there. Um, and I think that creates a disconnect. Um, what I like, when, especially when I go do a panel where I get to talk about uh, video game history in this regard at a, you know, a live event or what have you, is there's people in there who... Maybe they came in out of curiosity. Maybe they came in just to kill time or whatever. But they, um, their eyes kind of light up, you know, and they nod. And and sometimes they end up getting. In, they tell me they end up getting inspired, at wanting to know more about these people themselves. Because to me, that's that's a big a part of anything. You you got to know the history. Uh, to truly appreciate the present in any form of art, any form of entertainment. And uh, for some reason, video game history hasn't been embraced properly, I guess, maybe until now. We're seeing a little bit of an upswing now. Hmm. But, um, you know, it's just the, the fact that like I said, it, it creates a, an additional interest where maybe there hadn't been before. And uh, that's exciting because I think it's important. So, so what kept you involved with this learning? I mean, a lot of it's self-directed, and you're you're talking about this being a, a gap where there's uh, not a other lot of others to look to. What kept you sticking with it all these years? Just a love and a passion for it is where it started, um, and it certainly wasn't easy because, man, I was when I was picked on and bullied hard for this. I was the, uh, I was this, I was, I was such a nerd for video games that, you know, he actually wants to, to read about the, the people who made them and, and stuff like that. And, you know, but it was just, it was a passion for it. You know, I mean, you have people who are that passionate about the NFL and they can mm-hmm. sit there and tell you the, every Super Bowl MVP in the history of the, of the Super Bowl, right? You have people like that that are pas- that passionate about film history or, or anything. Well, video games happen to be that thing that latched on and impacted my young life so much that I wanted to know everything there was to know about it. Hmm. And I think part of what's increased, uh, increased that or kept me going with that all this time is the fact that I've been gaming at this point for a long time. You know, like I said, I started September 1981. And I never stopped, and I, and I never stuck in just one era. I'm not one of these guys from the King of Kong who still thinks it's 1983. <laughs> you know, um, you know, I'm in just as much into the modern consoles as I am into the old stuff and everything in between. And in more recent years, I, I looked up and looked around and was like, there's not very many people who ever kind of picked up uh, behind me and was doing the same type of thing. I felt and feel that there is a need for it. Uh, And there are other gaming historians and stuff like that you'll find out there. But I find myself in the odd position of being one of the younger ones. And I think with that comes some responsibility. Because there's going to come a point in time where I'm the grizzled old man, you know, that um, has been going through this. And, uh, you know, like I said, almost take it as a responsibility. Somebody had to be the first person to say this baseball game over here was a significant moment in baseball history somebody had to be the first person to say this film over here is a significant film and influenced all this stuff that came to follow yeah I might as well be the video game version of that so scott when did it occur to you that you could do something more than just as a hobby with this knowledge um i can pinpoint that one exactly too uh it was 2009 um, 
going back a few years before that, I mean, like I had from 1998 till about 2004, I'd run an arcade history website hmm. uh, that didn't go too much into depth, but, you know, kind of touched on a few things. And it proved so popular that I had the creators of some of these games reaching out to me, like Warren Davis and Jeff Lee for Qbert or Alan McNeil, the guy that created Berserk. Uh, all that was really cool. Um, that tra- that that's uh, that website would even get uh, White House IP visits sometimes. So someone in the Clinton administration really thought it was cool. Hmm. But um, it was uh, 2009. Uh, I was working with uh, Twin Galaxies at the time, and I got contacted by somebody that was working for G4 TV, and they wanted to bring hmm. Steve Wiebe onto their E3 broadcast to go for the Donkey Kong World Record, hmm. and. You know, it was really cool, and through a lot of pushing with my uh, boss, the owner of the place at the time, the owner of the place, um, managed to to get a green light, and we pursued this. And the further we went into the discussion, the more apparent it became to me that they and they were really good crew of people there. I got nothing bad to say about anybody that that worked at G Four. Um, they were passionate and friendly and professional. But they didn't know about Donkey Kong. They didn't know about the history of the game. Uh, they didn't know about the history of the world record. They didn't know the technical aspects of the inside of the machine. They thought there was RCA jacks inside that they could just hook their equipment up to. And I'm like, this is a arcade game built in Japan in 1981, folks. These connectors are not something you're going to have. Uh, you know, so my role expanded more and more with that as we went. And I went from being an initial point of contact to being an integral part of the planning process to actually getting a producer credit for their E3 broadcast. <laughs> um, as I helped uh, on the spot there, I actually call highlights and stuff to the producers. They called to the truck to grab and, mm. and all that sort of stuff. And um, they really liked it. And one of the, uh, actually the executive producer came up afterwards and he shook my hand. And he actually said, he's like, you know more about this game than everybody here. Thank you so much, and this and that, and it just kind of like a light went on in my head. Boom! Like, so all this goofy stuff that I used to get picked on for studying and learning, and you know, all this stuff combined with you know the stuff I learned about by buying these old arcade games and restoring them, fixing them up, and add in some of the theatrics I learned when I was in the wrestling business, when I was a pro wrestler for about a decade. You add all that in. And all this stuff that I thought individually was just kind of trivia, useless information, actually has a tangible value. Hmm. Um, and what can I do with this? What can I do with this? And, um, you know, I looked around and realized that, you know, straight up, it really kind of wasn't your big personality, your go-to person or personality for video gaming. That in a mainstream sense anyway, right? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Um so, you know, for rather than sit there and wish that somebody else would try and be that, I decided that I'm going to. Hmm. <laughs> and so that was it. And ever since the ever since that date, ever since June second, two thousand nine, wow. this is that uh, like right is the road like rolled right out in front of me and there was a light right down at the very end of that tunnel that's been trying to chase after that light. And uh now that light's in my face, which is huh. awesome. So Yeah. Yeah, you know, I, I love what you said right there, this idea of finding something. You know, when we ask that question, you know, why doesn't someone do this? Well, someone's got to do it. Why not me? That, that's powerful. That's huge. Well, I think that's, I mean, I think that's the role in anything. I mean, it, it's just that there's a lot of people that wish, why doesn't someone do this? Or why isn't someone do that? And, you know, then it's like they sit back down and be like, yeah, well, it'll be really cool when someone comes along and does that. Well, that doesn't do history any good you Mm -hmm. know i mean you know it just someone's got to be that someone's got to take that passion and um i mean what if roger ebert what if roger ebert had sat there and be like "Eh, i wish somebody would take uh being a movie critic as a serious job someday because that'd be really cool no he decided to do it and he changed what that was i mean he he completely changed what it was to be a movie critic and the importance of it um you know, or or somebody hadn't said, you know, hey, let's let's study the NFL really good and 
and be this on-air analyst and explain to the viewers not just that this is football, but why this stuff is important and explain to them why this is important and why it just happened and who are these people on the field. Mm -hmm. Um, People started doing that. Video games hadn't had anyone try to do that on a grand scale. I'll add that part. So why not me? So so let's talk about that for a second because in the absence of a credible or authoritative source, you have everyone else just trying to figure out what do we report and how do we report it. So looking back at how the media has covered and reported and viewed video games in the past, what are some of the mistakes and errors that you've seen made? Well, one of the things that is almost kind of an annoyance to me with, with that is that the narrative hasn't changed. I get people sometimes who just be like, well, someday that'll change. And maybe they're right. Maybe that'll change organically as the earliest gaming generations grow up and the last uh, generations of people that really weren't part of the video game movements, um, you know, move on. Um, But from my seat, I mean, these video game controversies and stereotypes and stuff like that, these things have existed since the mid 1970s. Mm-hmm. Um, that's a lot longer than, let's say, film or comic books or whatever had to deal with this sort of thing. Uh, I mean, we're we're going on you know almost forty years of the same tired narrative, uh, mm-hmm. which is that video gamers are a bunch of you know teenage boys. Mm-hmm. It's it's primarily male, and they're they're socially awkward and introverted and possibly violent and mm-hmm. and that sort of thing and. You know, it's continued this whole time when all somebody had to do in the 80s, if they believed that, was go out to any busy video arcade and they would have seen how social people were and how much of of an environment it was in that respect. And all they have to do today is the same thing. They think this, go take a camera crew, go out to one of these countless gaming conventions that's coming up right now and talk to these people, talk Mm -hmm. to everybody. And and learn what it is before you go on the air and talk about it. And they still don't. Um, I want to say it was about two years ago now. It just is one example because this was a local reporter that started this. Something went out on the uh, the news wire that gets picked up by all the news stations mm-hmm. uh, about more women are joining. Actually, let me rephrase how they put it. More girls are joining the gamer ranks. And it was a big story about how uh, at MLG Dallas there was all these girls and they were there to play video games too, gasp. Um, That started, I tracked it, because a locally based reporter who even happened to be a woman went to MLG Dallas. I guess maybe she drew the short straw and was the (laughs) one sent out there. And rather than cover the fact that there's these big cash prizes going on and who won the contest, she looked around and was shocked that there were young women here. Mm. And so she made the story about that. And, you know, it's just like all she had to do was even the most cursory of research. And she would have seen that, They've been around this thing for quite a while here, uh, right. and that it's not girls, they're women, because the average age of a video gamer has been over 30 since the turn of the century, at least. Mm-hmm. And, you know, so that's that's the biggest thing about it. Just do the research. They could sit down on five mi- in five minutes on Google and find out that the demographics of the industry are far, far different than what they go on the air and say. Mm-hmm. And... But I think that's the part of the reason for that is what we already touched on before as well, is because who's out there that's yeah. actually trying to grab them by the shoulders and say, wake up and look at the bigger picture here. They haven't been doing that. You know, mm-hmm. they're not your, your, your ABC News reporter or Fox News reporter or whatever. They're not, they don't go look at IGN. They don't mm-hmm. go look at Kotaku. They, half of them probably think E3 is something you scream at while playing Battleship. <laughs> um, you got to go to them and get up in their face and change their change their mind. Well, and I see I see this happening is there are newer ways that um, gamers or hobbyists or those who just have a passion for video games in general have looked for ways of expressing this common history, this common shared narrative and experience. What are some of the ways you've seen people out there expressing their love for video games and game culture that? transcend some of these stereotypes 
Oh, well, I mean, tons of them. Uh, there's, you know, uh, Child's Play Charity being one of them, um, as well as other charities like uh, Operation Supply Drop, that, right. which uh, does a lot to benefit uh, men and women who have, have served overseas and have come back uh, wounded um, or, you know, or are still over there and you know, need a break from the harsh reality of, of what they're experiencing out at, on the front lines. Mm-hmm. Um, Abel Gaber's charity, um, you know, things like that, that, I mean, huge amounts of money are being raised by these things and you wouldn't know it from if you just watch the mainstream media, they kind of don't even mention these sorts of things. Mm. Um, you know, there's, there's plenty of, of all women teams and clans out there who compete and win at these tournaments that, that fly in the face of that sort of thing as well. Um, you know, or, you know, an infinite number of people who, who speak at any of these live events all over the country. It's just, you know who goes and sees them. I mean, the stereotypes don't exist within. I guess you say that that ever growing bubble of video game culture. It's only outside of it that it's perceived to exist. And uh, you know, it's it's all it's it's right in front of them. To me, it's as, it's as easy to spot as the sunrise. But there you go. <laughs> well, that's because we're in the bubble. <laughs> well, you know, I like to say that I have one arm in and one arm out. I, I kind of try to to. You know, I don't want to go too far either way, but, you know, a lot of people are on one side or the other, and I think that's the yeah. challenge. Yeah, definitely. So let me ask you this. Um, now we're kind of crossing over. We've gone talking a little bit about the history of gaming and, and a little bit on the impact of, of how it's affected the lives of people who have enjoyed this hobby and, and have dedicated time and energy to it. Um, for you personally, what do you think is a lesson that video games can teach us about real life? Well, I think uh, in a maybe a subconscious kind of way, it, it can kind of teach you that your actions and your decisions influence everything else that goes on around you. Um, I, I think uh, not enough people maybe realize that in the real world, but regardless of what you play, yeah. whether it's you know Pac-Man or you know Call of Duty or World of Warcraft or Super Mario Brothers or whatever. Everything you do with that video game controller impacts what else is happening on that screen. The real world is the same way. The world doesn't happen around you. I mean, obviously, there's things you can't do anything about. Uh, obviously, the world keeps moving even if you just sit on your butt all day. But even you sitting on your butt all day has an impact on mm-hmm. what happens in your life. Yeah. Everything you do or don't do has an impact or influence or effect on your life. What that effect is, is in your control to a reasonable extent, so do something with it. Um, And another thing, too, I think video games of all kinds and all genres and all generations, they they teach uh, problem-solving skills and comprehensive thinking to... A level, I think, is beyond uh, a lot of other types of games and puzzles and senseless algebra problems and stuff that are out there. Mm. And those skills, whether you realize you're picking up on them or not, do impact your everyday life and how you face real challenges in life. Mm. Um, and, And I think that I really wish that that was something that was noted or mentioned more often. I don't even think most people who play video games realize it but i mean i can i can sit here and uh think of i could probably fill up 20 of your podcasts with instances <laughs> of of things that i can point at and say that i believe i have developed this skill or i avoided this car accident over here or or whatever based on skills that i learned from a lifetime of gaming yeah, incredible. Well, let me throw you a softball here. What do you think video games do not teach us? Um, I don't believe for a second that video games create real-world violence. Uh, again, we have this narrative going all the way back to, to Shark Attack and Death Race in the mid-70s mm-hmm. and through Space Invaders and Defender and Berserk. Oh, boy. Anyone who doesn't <laughs> know about Berserk... Um, Berserk was a highly controversial game in the early 80s. Got to look up a guy named Dr. Thomas Radecki and look up a person named Mrs. Ronnie Lamb, L-A-M-M, 
for some reason, there's not much about them online or out there, but there is some stuff. And that game was cited particularly similar ways that your modern controversies over Grand Theft Auto are laid out. It's almost the same tired argument. I don't believe that someone's going to go play Grand Theft Auto, at least any reasonably sane person is going to go play Grand Theft Auto or Call of Duty and then go out in the real world and do that sort of thing. And in fact, I actually believe that these games can serve as an outlet for aggression and an escape from perhaps the pressures of the real world that might sometimes drive somebody over the edge. Mm-hmm. And um, it's it, that's something that I will stand right up every time that there's somebody that goes on TV and and talks about it, especially since there's only one point of view. It's always a child psychologist with a bad comb over and, and never <laughs> anybody that, you know, plays video games. I mean, right. I, I, I think I told somebody uh, via uh, somebody commented on a YouTube video uh, of mine actually just this morning or overnight. Uh, about a one-on-one I did with a child psychologist on a, a local ABC affiliate broadcast uh, about a year and a half ago. Mm-hmm. I, I totally dominated the debate, by the way. I really do feel that way, and so does he. And uh, But, you know, that's that's kind of the, the narrative on that. You know, it's like it, it, doesn't, it doesn't do that. <laughs> it never has done that. It's never going to do that. Yeah. Boy, well – I, I want to ask this because I know you've got a lot more content out there. What is the best way for, for listeners to see you, to hear you, to learn more about uh, the, the wealth of knowledge that you have to offer? Um, well, that's an ever-changing thing that's in motion. Um, I do, you know, of course, have my website, which is patrickscottpatterson.com, which uh, is always kept up to date with whatever I've got going on or whatever or whoever I I feel needs a little promotion at the time. Um, and all of it also flows right through my Twitter, which is at original PSP. Um, that's my most active social media network by far. Mm. And I'm always there either updating people on what I'm doing or you know, taking part in or starting discussions about these types of things. Um, And, of course, you know, you can go to either one of those and see that I I speak at live events uh, all around the the country uh, about these types of topics, some of them fun, some of them serious, all of them that tie into this this stuff. Um, And I got a TV show in development that will hopefully go into production, knock on wood. Mm-hmm. Um, where some of that will be covered. And, then, of course, I'm also in a few documentary films that either have just come out or are coming out uh, later this year. Excellent. Excellent. Well, I got one question for you, and this is this is a bit uh, inspired by the really great tweets that you send out on Twitter. Um, so I want to know if you would answer this question. Okay. You are in a carpool, and you have three – others that are going to ride in the carpool with you all of them must be video game characters which three game characters would you choose to carpool with <sighs> well let's see uh well i'd have to have my old buddy pac-man um not just because that was the first video game i ever played and if you'll notice when i pop up in any of these films or broadcasts or at a live event i'm always wearing pac-man on me somewhere but he'd also know all the good places to stop and eat. Huh. And, you know, he would, man. And, you know, <laughs> I believe you. He, you know, that's important when you're on the road. Otherwise, you just eat trash. You know, he'd know all the good eating spots, and that's important. Um, I'd have to go with Mario mm-hmm. as well uh, for similar reasons. Not just if, if I've been on a lot of adventures with him going back to day one, but, you know, his stamina. I mean, again, this nothing, nothing, nothing gets to this guy. He's he's happy go lucky, and you know, I'm sure he's got some stories, man. Um, and maybe he can explain, you know, how he keeps letting Peach get uh, kidnapped. <laughs> because I mean, think by now that he would have figured out that hey, look, this is going to happen, and we need to take some preventative measures here. Right. Um, the third one that's a little tougher. Um, you know, I, I, but I guess I believe. Uh, or I, 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 I know it's no guess. I believe I heavily believe in learning from uh, your elders, mm-hmm. asking questions of those who came before you and have seen some stuff. So I guess it may be a, a case like that. Maybe I don't know, old snake. Maybe oh. you know. Uh, I'm sure he could tell some stories. You know, and 
could teach me how to be stealthy in a cardboard box. Um, <laughs> you know, you never know when that's going to come in handy. Incredibly useful skills. I, I think that's a winning road trip right there. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> right. man. Scott, I thank you for your time today. I really uh, appreciated your knowledge, wisdom, and, and some of your stories as well. Uh, thank you again. Look forward to uh, hearing more and seeing more of you out there. Hey, I appreciate you having me out, man. And remember, that's original PSP on Twitter. And uh, by the time this airs, I still can't announce something yet. I do got one absolutely game-changing thing that will be happening this summer. Literally just, just got uh, confirmed. So stay tuned, man. It's going to be a wild ride. Looking forward to it. Thank you, sir. Thank you.